you, you, you had back in the day. Uh, some of your first jobs. I, I laugh because I, I consider my, my first employment. One of them was uh, one of my first jobs. I worked for Burger King. You guys familiar with Burger King? And I worked for Burger King for one day. That, that, was, the short, that was the shortest job I ever had. And you want to know why I worked for Burger King for one day? Is because when the manager went through all the job duties, I thought to myself, the demands are too high, I'm out of here. You can give me all the french fries you want, but what they wanted me to do as a young teenager and, and one of my first jobs, I was like, you're asking too much, I'm gone. So one day at Burger King. So then I got a job, and if some of you remember being in the Valley for, for a while, uh, I got a penny saver route. You guys remember the penny saver? Uh, free, free little newspaper, and I was up in, in North Phoenix, and uh, I covered this, this, this range of, of, of a ge geographic area that probably was about 500 homes. So as a young boy, they would deliver the paper at my house. I'd roll it in, in my garage, put a rubber band on it, and then pack these totes full of the penny saver. And this was before I could drive. And they gave you so, like, I literally think they gave you a penny per penny saver that you delivered. So 500, do the math. So there I was riding my bike through my, my neighborhood, delivering my penny saver. So two full huge totes of penny saver newspapers. Here I am on my souped up Evil Knievel Huffy bike. You know, the kind with the padded banana seat and a big flag sticking out of the back. So I was cruising and I just had a tough time keeping my balance on this bike. And, and after probably a week, I gave up on the penny saver. Why? Because the demands, the requirements, for what was needed for that job, just it wasn't cutting it for me. And I think about you know the fact that sometimes, and this is what God taught me early on, is that sometimes the things that we get involved in and are asked of us will stretch us. Sometimes the demands that are placed upon our our lives, whether it be in in relationships or a career or job, are 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 not they're not going to be easy. Have you, have you discovered this in your own life that when you enter into some realm that you're interested in, sometimes the expectations can be such where you're tempted to say, you know what, it's too much, I'm going to walk away from this. Well, this is what happened to the prophet Jonah. Jonah was told by God to do a certain job, and Jonah decided that, you know what, it's too much to ask. I'm not going to do it. So he left that calling to go do his own thing. Now I'm going to tell you, far greater than a Burger King employer or a penny saver employer, when God hires you on to do something, and you find the demand to be too stringent, too difficult, too tough, there is no option to just go ahead and say, you know what, thanks, but no thanks, I'm going to do my own thing. And I'm going to tell you something, when it comes to the followership that is required of us to love Jesus, to follow God, the demands are tough. What God wants for us are going to be things that sometimes we are tempted to throw in the towel and say, you know what, God, this is not what I signed up for. I don't understand what you're doing. And I'm going to tell you that more than being able to trace why God does things, you need to be able to trust that God has what's best for you. Jonah, chapter 1 and 2 is what we're going to look at this morning because I want to explore this, this prophet that is often known as the reluctant prophet. He's sometimes known as the angry prophet. Sometimes he's known as the pouting prophet prophet. This is a unique section of scripture because unlike the other prophets in the Old Testament, this one is autobiographical of this man's life. Not following the custom of the prophets that we've been studying up to this point where they come and they issue a warning toward, toward Israel or toward the surrounding nations. This one is more a character study of what not to do as someone who loves God. All right, Jonah serves us as an example that it is always better to obey the Lord than disobey the Lord. And there's a lot of sarcasm, there's a lot of ironic twist in the passage, and unfortunately, most of us, when we hear the name Jonah, we immediately think of what? Fish! A whale, some sort of creature that swallowed him up. But I'm going to tell you, that is such a small part of this amazing account that God has 
to us. So we're going to spend two weeks and unpack what really is happening in the book of Jonah. And I believe, like I was, we can even prepare this message, surprised at the amazing truth that's here and the lessons that we can learn from this reluctant, angry, pouting prophet. And so we're going to look at three points this morning. Turn your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1. The first point we're going to consider is God's patience with our running Secondly, God's pursuit in our rebellion. And third, God's protection for our rescue. Those are the three points. We'll go back and and I'll help you fill in those blanks in case you missed it. But I want you to know Jonah didn't always start on a a negative foot. If you go back to 2 Kings, write this passage down. 2 Kings chapter 14 verse 25 it tells us that Jonah went to the king who was named Jeroboam II at the time. And even though King Jeroboam did not honor the Lord in his life, Jonah gave the king advice. The king followed Jonah's advice and it expanded the borders of Israel and protected Israel as a people. This is the beginning of Jonah's ministry. It was It started out successful. It started off on the right foot. He allowed Israel to be protected and enlarge its boundaries and its borders. That's what we see in 2 Kings. That's the only other place outside of the the book of Jonah itself that we know anything about this prophet. So now we come to the book of Jonah, and it's anything but positive about his life. So I'm going to tell you, something. sometimes it's, it, you can start off well and, and not finish well. Sometimes you can start off well, and, and success isn't always going to be par for the course when it comes to what you do for the Lord. We're going to see a real-life example of a man who, who had ministry successes, but is in a season of incredible failure before God because he simply disobeys what the Lord wants for him. The point is this, God's patience with our running. If you look at Jonah chapter 1, first three verses, here's what the account says. The Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so he went down to Joppa, found a ship which he was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Stop right there. What we have in those first three verses is a man pretty much hearing from God and saying, God, I'm not doing that. And he goes the other direction. God says, urgently, quickly, Arise and go to Nineveh, and I want you to share my love with those people. But instead of doing that, Jonah wakes up, hears this message, and goes the opposite direction. Now, let's just all be honest this morning. How many of you, when God has clearly told you to do something, decided to go the opposite direction? All of us are in good company. This should be called Disobedient Anonymous. Welcome to DA. My name is Scott. There's been many opportunities I've heard from the Lord and done the exact opposite of what he's required of me. All of us can relate with running from what we know we're supposed to do. Amen? All of us can relate with God telling us to do something and then turning and doing the exact opposite. The question is, why does Jonah turn and not do what God wants him to do. Well, you need to understand something about Nineveh. Nineveh is modern day Mosul. You know where Mosul, Iraq is? You've probably heard about it in the news. That's where Nineveh was located. It was one of the greatest cities in the ancient Near East. It was a huge city. It took three days to walk from one end to the other of the city. It was filled with Assyrians, and the Assyrians were known as one of the most cruel and violent people groups of all time. They found creative ways to kill and torture and persecute people. These people were masters in torturing people, and I'm not even going to begin to get into the R-rated examples of what they did to their victims. But let me just tell you, they were cruel, they were nasty, they were violent. 
And oftentimes the Assyrians would come in and they would exercise their violence on the people of Israel. So all of a sudden God says, Jonah, get up quickly and go tell the, the people of Nineveh about my love for them. Well, if you knew about the reputation of the Assyrians, if you knew that those Assyrians were some of the people responsible for inflicting harm to your own people, I'm sure, like no one, the Jonah, you and I would sit there and go, let them find your love on their own. I'm not going to them. You know, they are my enemy. God, did you, did you not see what they did to, to my neighbors a year ago? Do you not consider the fact that these people are cruel and they're so distant from you? And God yet says, Jonah, you go and you love those people. Because there's something you need to understand about the heart of God. God does not just bless one particular people group and then just say, just go ahead and remain comfortable and remain at ease in your little cluster and just forget about the rest of the world. See, God never localized his love for just Israel. Every opportunity God had to encourage his people was to go and bless the nations around you because all people are deserving of my love. Write down Genesis chapter 12, where God tells Abraham, you know, Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you in turn can be a blessing to the entire world. And the message to Abraham is still relevant and pertinent to us today, where he says to the church, you've been blessed so that now you can go and bless all the nations of the world. And I'm going to tell you, it's, a, it's, it's easy to work among your own people group. It's easy to, to work among those that are like you, that agree with you, that dress like you, that vote the same way you vote, that drive the same car you drive. It's easy to do that. But now God says to you, go bless those that are unlike you. Go bless those that have perhaps harmed you. Go bless those that have maybe persecuted. And then we sit there and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Jonah, don't turn tail on the command that I've issued to you. I'm not holding you responsible for how those people are going to respond. I'm holding you responsible to share the good news that I've planted deep within your heart. And have we not been a discriminatory person before the Lord when it comes to sharing his love with people? Are you not also guilty like I am where we sit there and we size somebody up with the way they look or the way they act and we automatically think people are beyond the reach of God's grace and God says, don't do that. There are people from Nineveh all over this world and there are people that you think are undeserving of God's love. I just want you to stop and consider the fact what makes you think you're worthy of the love of God. You think you're all that a bag of chips? You're not. You think that when God put you on his team, like he got an A-star player? Forget it. We are all losers and sinners and rebellious before the Lord. And it's only because his grace that he has shown us that it has nothing to do with you or I. It has solely to do with his love for people. And so... We go forth and we share the message. When God says you go love that person, you love them. You go bless that person, you bless them. And you do whatever it takes to reach them with the love that I've given to you. Are we on? My battery died? I think I know how to do this. They taught this this in seminary. You know that place where I got the Masters of Divinity degree? Did I mention it twice already today? Thank you. Check one. Are we on? Wow, that was fast, wasn't it? Good job, you guys. Good job. All right. Where were we? Oh, yeah, Nineveh. Consider this for a moment. Jonah is asked to go to Nineveh. I'm going to tell you geographically, it's about 500 miles northeast of where Jonah lives. But instead of doing what God wants him to do, 
he finds a ship and goes 2,500 miles the opposite direction. Because Tarshish was literally considered the end of the world. Perhaps in modern day Spain. He goes down, finds a ship, gets on board that ship, pays the fare, right? And sets sail to, to go against what God wants him to do. And I'm going to tell you something, you guys. When it comes to running from God. It is costly, it is tiring, it is not the choice you want to make at the end of the day. He was willing to go 2,500 miles in disobedience rather than 500 miles in obedience. It's going to cost more, it's going to require more time, and it's going to be taxing on you. At the end of the day, Jonah's going to be a testimony to say, obey rather than disobey. So he boards a ship for Tarshish, and he goes onto the boat, and he's trying to run away from God. Now what I love about God is that he is patient with our running. Sometimes he lets us run. But one thing I know about God too is that the running will come to an end eventually and he will pursue us if we continue to be rebellious and disobedient. Which is our second point. Notice verse 4. So he boards this ship trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now... This is, this is like theology 101, right? Can we ever flee from the presence of the Lord? I mean, consider Psalm 139, right? The psalmist says, where can I go to flee from your presence, O Lord? If I go to the highest heights of heaven, you're there. If I go to the depths of Sheol, that, that, that place of, of the grave and darkness, you're there. There's nowhere where I can run to, to outrun you. Even though in our hearts we feel like, yeah, we can distance ourselves, one thing I know about God is that He loves pursuing those whom He loves. Even though that pursuit may be disciplinary, He's a Father who loves His kids, and He's only going to allow us to disobey so much before He gets our attention, which is verse 4. Read this. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. Who's the one who hurls the wind? It's, it's God, right? So here's Jonah disobeying the word of God, but there's no way he's going to get by with disobeying the works of God. He hurls a great wind on the sea, and there's a great storm on the sea that the ship was about to break up. And then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was on the ship into the sea and lightened it for them. But Jonah had gone down below into the hold of the ship to lay down and fall asleep. Everything is going to hell in a handbasket, literally. And Jonah goes to sleep. Because I'm going to tell you, his spirit is so tired from running. His heart is so tired from disobeying God. Just like the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 32, my bones wearied, my soul wearied from not doing what you wanted me to do. And these men are fighting for them of their lives trying to save the ship, praying to their gods because they worshipped a lot of different gods, and the very one who had the solution to the problem did nothing about it. And so the captain approached him, verse 6, and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. You know, making sure that they have all their gods covered. Certainly Jonah has maybe a different God. Pray to your God. And each man said to his mate, come let us cast lots so that we may learn whose account this calamity has struck us. And they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they're curious because they're praying and nothing's happening. They're throwing cargo over the ship. Nothing's happening. They've got this unknown passenger that they, they have no clue who he is and perhaps he knows something about the calamity that's happening. And no one is getting to the heart of the issue. And so what do they do? They go to this old way of decision making called casting lots. And I'm going to tell you in Proverbs 16, 33, it says you may cast lots, but the Lord is the one who's the decision maker behind it. And what do they do when they cast lots? They throw a, a stone out, something that's colored on different sides, and whoever it falls to, that person is the point or the, the object of reference that they need to deal with. They cast lots, and guess who the lot falls to? Jonah. 
As it's some arbitrary just, you know, what's going on here? Like Yahtzee, just throw the dice out and see what happens. God was behind this because he wants to reveal something going on in the situation, specifically in the, in the prophet's heart. And there's four things I want us to consider in this passage. Number one, I want us to consider the fact that God is relentless. Secondly, God is revealing. Third, God is reducing. And fourth, God is rescuing. So God pursues this rebellious prophet, his rebellious child. And the first thing we see is that God is relentless in getting his attention. Reminds me of a book that I read when I was younger and I found it a joy to read to my kids. It's a famous bestseller book called The Runaway Bunny. Who's familiar with The Runaway Bunny? Well, I'm going to read it for you this morning. Because look, it's, it's, it takes a minute. Once there's a little bunny who wanted to run away. So he said to his mother, hey, I'm running away. If you run away, said his mother, I will run after you for you are my little bunny. If you run after me, said the little bunny, I will become a fish in a trout stream and I will swim away from you. Well, if you become a fish in a trout stream, said his mother, I will become a fisherman and I will fish for you. Got to stop to show you guys the colored pages. Mom fishing in the stream. Well, if you become a fisherman, said the little bunny, I will become a rock on the mountain high above you. Well, if you become a rock on the mountain high above me, said his mother, I will be a mountain climber and I will climb to where you are. And there she is, climbing the mountains to go after her little bunny. Well, if you become a mountain climber, said the little bunny, I will be a crocus in a hidden garden. Well, if you become a crocus in a hidden garden, said his mother, I will be a gardener and I will find you. And there she is, with her gardening apparel on, going after her little bunny. And if you're a gardener and find me, said the little bunny, I will be a bird and fly away from you. Well, if you become a bird and fly away from me, says his mother, I will be a tree that you come home to. And there's the mom as a tree, waiting for the little bunny to fly into her branches. Well, if you become a tree, said the little bunny, I will become a little sailboat and I will sail away from you. Well, if you become a sailboat and sail away from me, said his mother, I will become the wind and blow you where I want you to go. And there's mom as a powerful wind blowing the sailboat where she wants it to go. Well, if you become the wind and blow me, said the little bunny, I will join the circus away on a flying trapeze. Well, if you go flying on a flying trapeze, said his mother, I will be a tightrope walker and I will walk across the air to you. And there they are at the circus, the mom pursuing the little bunny. Well, if you become a tightrope walker and walk across the air, said the bunny, I will become a little boy and run into a house. Well, if you become a little boy and run into a house, said the mother bunny, I will become your mother and catch you in my arms and hug you. And there they are by the fire. Shucks, said the little bunny. I might just as well stay where I am and be your little bunny. And so he did. Have a carrot, said the mother bunny. You know what I love about that? Is as I shared it with my kids, the idea of permanent love, the idea of pursuant love, the idea that sometimes children rebel. They want to make choices on their own. And as a, as a parent, sometimes you let those kids make those choices, but you never let them make choices where they're able to escape your love for them. And I think how true is the theology of a kid's book like this when it comes to God's love for us. God sometimes hedges us in, but he gives us freedom in those boundaries and says, you may try to run, but you need to know that I'm going to be that, that parent to you that loves you and cares for you to let you just do whatever you want. I may allow a little bit of freedom, but you know in the end, I will track you down because I love you. I will pursue you because I want you to know that my love for you is greater than any love the world could ever have for you. And so God pursues Jonah like the mother bunny pursues the little bunny. See, you guys, God is relentless. And when we ignore his word, 
This is sometimes where God's works come in. Like I said before, God allows a storm to now affect the whole ship. Men on board this ship are suffering because of one man's disobedience. See, one man's rebellion is causing everyone's life to be in jeopardy. And God is relentless to bring forth some truth from this situation. And the fact that God is relentless, I praise God for that. That he pursues us when we are disobedient. He pursues us when we're rebellious. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, whom the Father loves, sometimes he disciplines. And that's good because we're all in need of discipline once in a while. Amen? Some of us more than others. Just turn to your name and say you're one of them. No, don't, don't do that, all right? You know what I think of is the fact that Jonah is taking his relationship with, with God for granted. Skip to chapter 4, Jonah chapter 4. Look at the second verse. Because this verse gives us the heart of where this prophet's at. Trying to to outrun God, trying to disobey God. Look at verse 2 of chapter 4 of Jonah. He prays to the Lord, says, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? In order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. The heart in Jonah was this. He couldn't bear the thought of his enemies being saved by a God who saved him. He only wanted good for himself and didn't want good for somebody else. And this is so reminiscent of the elder brother in the prodigal son account. Write down Luke chapter 15 because you need to know the prodigal son, that very familiar parable that we know the son walked away with his father's inheritance, squandered on sex, drugs, and rock and roll, came to the end of himself, realized that he was so much better off in his dad's house, returns to the father. The father's eagerly waiting for his son to come back. As soon as he sees the, the white of the son's eyes, runs out and embraces him and welcomes home. That's all wonderful, but the real character in this account is the older brother who was in the backyard pouting because his dad was so merciful to a brother that he thought didn't deserve it. And the father goes to the elder son and says, what are you doing? Your your younger brother was lost and now he's found. And the only thing the older brother can think about was that His dad should have been more of a man of justice than forgiveness. Dad, did I not do this for you? Did I not do that for you? Was I not the perfect child? Was I not obedient to all? And the son listed this litany of reasons why he should have been the favored child and that other son should have just got justice. Well, when you forget about the just, when you, when you only think about the justice of God and you forget about his forgiveness of God, you end up like Jonah, not caring for people. God is not impressed with your resume of things you do for him. God is not impressed with the litany of, well, I went to church twice on Sunday and sometimes on Wednesday nights, right? Because that makes you spiritual, right? I read through the Bible twice this year. (laughs) Look at me. I listen to only Christian radio and watch only Christian movies. And we come up with this litany of stuff that we think we can do to earn God's love. And he says, you need to know my relationship with you is not based upon justice. My relationship to you is based upon forgiveness because I know you're going to mess up. And the older brother could not stand the fact that he had performed so much for the Father, and yet the Father forgives so quickly. Who's the problem child in this story? The older brother. Who's the problem in this story? Jonah. Because he forgot about the forgiveness of God. God's highest achievement, man's deepest need. If we are not the conveyors of this truth, the world is dying around us. Justice will come and we'll leave that in the hands of God. You share the forgiveness. You share the grace. You share the mercy. You share the love. Let God take care of the justice. You be the forgivers. Because why? You've been forgiven. How dare you say you've been forgiven and balk at the idea of somebody else being forgiven like you've been forgiven. So God is relentless in bringing this storm. And I'm going to tell you what, whether you're experiencing a physical storm, which is doubtful because we live in Arizona, amen, but sometimes the storm 
can come on your income. Sometimes God can bring a, a, a storm upon your health. Sometimes God can bring a storm and, and crush your grades, take away your scholarships, rob you of your dreams in school. Because God will bring whatever storm into your life so that you get your attention off of the stuff you think you're going to find security in and be reminded of the most important thing, and that's your relationship with Him. God is relentless in doing this. Secondly, God is revealing. Look at verse 6. So the captain comes down to the where Jonah's sleeping. Right? Like, how can you sleep? What God do you worship? Now, I want you to see how God is going to use this captain and these sailors to bring out the stuff that Jonah should have been living, in, living off of in his heart. The revealing is that sometimes adversity brings forth the, the gold that's been buried under our disobedience. Basically, the captain says, who are you? What God do you worship? Start praying to that God. And then they cast lots. The lot lot falls on Jonah in verse 8. They said to him, Tell us now on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he says, notice verse 9. Here's here's the moment God starts revealing the truth. He says to them, I am a Hebrew. Hebrew. And I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. The truth is starting to surface. See, what you have to realize is adversity sometimes comes into our life. And while it may be punitive, I'm going to tell you something else. Adversity sometimes has a work where it is redemptive. And now we're getting someplace. God is causing this tough tough time to fall upon this ship because of one man's disobedience. And now he's forced to come to terms with what and whom he believes. I am a Hebrew. I worship the God who created this. Right? These sailors know the ocean. They know the constellations. They know the environment in which they daily work. And now here's Jonah saying, the God who's behind this all, I know Him. And I'm going to tell you right now, you guys, when difficulty strikes, whether it be you or somebody in your circle, the greatest place you can take yourself and somebody else is to the fact that there's a sovereign God behind all of this. That there's a God that we know holds the cosmos in existence. We know that there's a God who holds the world in His hands. We know there's a God who hasn't walked away from the control panels of the universe and just let things kind of willy-nilly take place. But there's a God who's sovereign over the affairs of nations and men and women. And the place we go back to is we know God is doing something. We may not know what, but we at least start with God. Can I tell you, you're going to walk into work tomorrow. And someone's going to ask you, what happened this weekend? You know what you do? You go to that place, you say, you know what? Yesterday in church, I was struck by something. They may be going through a difficulty and say, can you tell me more about this? I have a guy here at the coffee shop. So every week it seems like I share a story with somebody that maybe I share Jesus with. Well, once again, it happened this week. Out there on the patio, I'm sharing Jesus with a guy who's been through hell and back. And as he's disclosing this information, he knows I'm a pastor. And what's interesting, sometimes his little litmus test of, of how much I love Jesus is like he'll cuss frequently around me, and every time he'll stop and be like, sorry, pastor. Like, you know, the moment he drops that bomb, I'm like, <gasps> you know, like, I don't do that. People introduce them, their parents visiting around the town, like people who know I'm a pastor. Hey, he owns a coffee shop, but he's also a pastor. And then the mom will go off and she'll say some sort of explan- you know, ex- expletive, like looking for a reaction. I just sit there and let roll with it, because I'm used to living with my wife, you know, but no, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. She, she is Baptist through and through, so she's good. No, I'm just kidding. But these people, you know, they're like looking for reactions from us. And you know what? I don't think people know that we can be trusted people that they can just share their hearts with and expose their guts to, and we're not going to react because of the way they're explaining something, but more importantly than the way they explain something is the, the struggle they're having inside. And I sat on that patio a few days ago with a guy, and he was just sharing his heart, and my, my job was to point him back to God. It wasn't to give him a free coffee. 
It wasn't to say, you know, just hang out here and just be comfortable. It was to point him to the God who's in control of all things. And that's what I'm going to continue to do with this guy because he is hopeless. He is helpless without God's help. Jonah is beginning to realize this as God is revealing something inside. And after the revelation is coming about, he's also reducing something. Look at verse 11. So he discloses this information about who he is. Verse 10, Then the men become extremely frightened, for they said to him, How can you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them this. Hey guys, I'm going to acknowledge my, my faults. I'm to acknowledge my sin before you. He tells them that God is bringing this calamity because of his own disobedience. Verse 11, so they said to him, what should we do so that this storm may be calm for us? And the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. So what does he say? He says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come. Basically make me a sacrifice. Right? Right? They've already thrown all their cargo overboard. They've already prayed to all their gods. Part of them are thinking, what do we got to lose? Let's throw this guy over. But instead, look at verse uh, 13. However, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier. And they did not want to throw this guy in. Verse 14, they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, are pleased uh, with with what you have done. Meaning, they at least have reverence for this God that Jonah supposedly worships, and they're like, we don't want to be accountable for this man's blood if we throw him overboard. But yet they realize, Jonah is speaking truth, because there needs to be a substitute. At this moment, while God is a God of justice, he's a God of forgiveness. And maybe Jonah and his act will appease God in this calamity. And and so these men just start thinking about it. And guess what they do? They throw him overboard per his request. And I'm going to tell you something. It is a substitute that we need to escape the storms of life. See, what Jonah pictures for us is the truth that we need a substitute because you can pray to all your gods, you can throw all your cargo overboard, but it is the human substitute that we need, and Jonah is a picture of that because who is the ultimate human substitute that will ultimately save us from the storm? Jesus. Good answer. You guys all passed with an A+. Verse 15. So they picked Jonah up, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Notice what happens. These men, their hearts are changed. And they fear the Lord, and they offer a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows, meaning they committed their lives to the God that Jonah worships. See, just when you think you're running from God, God can use any situation to turn people's hearts to Him. Even in your disobedience, even in your rebellion, God is rescuing. And so, while men are reduced to nothing because there's nothing to the cross you're able to bring but belief in Him who is your substitute, these men have done everything, they're at their wit's end, and that's exactly where God begins to do His great work is when it comes to you being saved, it has nothing to do with your works. It entirely has to do with his mercy. They throw Jonah in, the storm stops. And they realize that the God that Jonah worshipped is the God that they ought to now worship. So God not only rescues these men physically, he rescues them spiritually. Is that awesome or what? And they made vows, verse 17, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Now I want you to know something as we finish this up, because we have one more important point to talk about. God's protection in our rescue. So many times we grow up hearing the account of Jonah, we think about the great fish, and we become so fixated on the fish. Could this happen scientifically? Is there such a creature in this world? I'm going to tell you right now that, you know what? You can reason and analyze all you want. The key is you're not to focus on the great fish. You're to focus on the great God behind the great fish. If God can bring something out of nothing, he can certainly create an animal so big that swims in the water that could swallow a man. As crazy as that may seem. 
If God wanted to create a shrimp so big, beyond jumbo shrimp, to swallow a human being, he could do it. But the point of the story is not to be fixated on this fish. The point of the story is for you to be fixated on a God who is greater than anything we could ever imagine, who loves us in our rebellion, who loves us in our disobedience, and is willing to forgive when we are brought to our senses that we can't live without Him. Amen? So God appoints a big fish. You think God knew exactly when those men would throw Jonah overboard? You think God planned that big fish to come along and and swallow him up? I'm going to tell you, once Jonah was thrown overboard, the fish didn't come around right away. Look at chapter 2. Here's the story. Jonah prays to the Lord, his God, from inside the stomach of the fish. There's no greater place to pray than in the stomach of a fish, FYI, I guess. He says, I called out of my distress to the Lord. He answered me. I cried to help from the depth of Sheol. He heard my voice. He had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me, and all the breakers had written billows passed over me. And so I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Here's the scene. This man is reflecting on where he was before the fish swallowed him. As you're going to see, he speaks of his descent from the boat, under the water. And I'm going to tell you, unlike us who live in Arizona, where it seems like everybody knows how to swim, people in this culture did not know how to swim. They didn't live in areas that were necessarily near the ocean. They didn't need to have this skill. So here's Jonah falling in the ocean. And in his mind, he's saying in his heart that as I'm falling, falling, I justly deserve to fall, but there's a hope that I will once again worship you, God. And then he says in verse 4, So I've been expelled from your sight. I will will worship you again. Verse 5, Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. This man is choking. He's fighting for air as he continues to plummet down into the water. I descended to the roots of the mountains, meaning he fell so far his feet were able to to touch the bottom, the, the floor of the ocean. And the earth with its bars was around me forever, but you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay, salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Chapter 2 is his prayer. And as he's reflecting upon his life being saved, he's not so much consumed by, by the fish as he is to the fact that he justly deserved death, and yet God showed him mercy. The sea was ready to kill him. This represents death. But God provided a means for his rescue And that rescue was the fish in which he existed for three days and three nights. The fish was his protection. And as is customary for the Lord, he shows us the container for our protection. The very thing in which we're saved from drowning. The very thing that saves our lives, ultimately. You go back to Noah. When you think about Noah, what do you think about the ark. And God caused a great water to cover the earth. And what was the very object that saved Noah and his family? The boat. Jonah is cast into the sea. He's drowning. He's choking for life. And all of a sudden a fish comes and saves him. The vehicle of saving was this fish. And then Jesus in Mark, Matthew chapter 12 The only time Jesus associates himself or identifies himself with a prophet, it's with Jonah. And he says there's going to be a sign. Just like when Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, three nights, so shall I be in the grave for three days and three nights. And if you believe in me, though you are drowning and dying in this ocean of calamity in this world, I will be that saving protection for you. Jonah points us to Jesus. Jesus reminds us of the sea of calamity. 
He reminds us of the storms of affliction. He reminds us that there's nothing in this world that can deliver you like He can deliver you. Did you know both Jonah and Jesus are from Galilee? Did you know that there's a connection between these two where they both entered the jaws of death? He, Jonah, was in the ocean. Christ went to the grave, faced death, faced sin, faced, faced the grave head on, and he did it, did it so that you and I can be delivered from the calamities of this world. Jesus says, you want a sign? Look at Jonah. Because left to your own devices, you will drown. But if you call out to God to be saved, God will send a deliverer to you and rescue you. Jesus is that deliverer. Amen? Awesome. Awesome. Today is the day of salvation. Do not think for a moment you can bring your good works and your, your duties and your obligations and your perfect church attendance to the Lord and He's going to be impressed. What he's impressed by is bringing you to the end of yourself where you have nothing but a cry for help out of distress and you say, Jesus, save me. Remember Peter sinking in the water? Lord, save me. God saved him. Because there was nothing in Peter that he could save himself. It was entirely upon Jesus. That's our message we preach here at Missio Dei. There's hope in no one else but Christ. There's deliverance in no one else but Jesus. And like Jonah, we have a God who loves us, even in our rebellion. He will chase after us relentlessly in our disobedience. And he does it so that at the end of the day, he may be magnified. And you would have a story. Because I once was lost, but now I'm found. How about you? Have you been rescued by this great God? We'll talk about it more next week as we look at Jonah Jonah chapter 3, chapter 4. If you think Jonah from this point on is going to make right decisions, you're wrong. He still continues to be angry and pout, but at least we now have a foundation of a story which we can build on. We'll deal with the second half next week, but know this, there is always hope in Jesus. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, you are amazing. Thank you for the account of Jonah, the reminder, the refresher that you're a God who causes things to happen in our life to get our attention. Forgive us for the ways we've wandered. Forgive us for the ways we've rebelled. Renew a right spirit in us and a right attitude in us to choose to do what's right because, Lord, you have commanded it. But Lord, the doing of the right is never divorced from the relationship with you as our, as our Father. So Lord, may we not do things out of duty, but may we do things out of delight. May we continue to trust your heart, and even as we weather the storms in our lives, may our heart be anchored to Jesus, who is the anchor for our souls. Remind us of your presence, remind us of your goodness. Thank you for Jesus, our Deliverer. May all of our hearts trust solely in Him. Thanks, God, for your faithfulness to us today, for the songs, for the time in the Word, for our interaction with one another. Be glorified. May Christ be exalted and continue to draw us to Yourself. We pray this in His name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift up His face towards you and give you His peace forever and ever.